to another Genesis study. We are going to close out Genesis chapter 14, if all goes well. And I want to start right off with a hillbilly holler to Charles Smith. Uh, he's my son by marriage, and he's my brother by new birth. And I uh, love Charlie. And uh, by the time he sees this, he'll be celebrating a birthday. So, hillbilly holler. And uh, I want to go ahead and open with a word of prayer and get right into our study and ask the Lord, Father, we just ask you to help us as we study. Lord, help these people who are watching these videos to simply be faithful, to day in, day out, uh, partake in the daily bread of your word, allow your Holy Spirit to teach them. And we pray these studies would just simply be a help to them and that they'll fall in love with that book. And in so doing, fall in love with Jesus. And we pray these things in His precious name. Amen. Before we get into the study, I want to mention, uh, we recommend some good resources when we find them. Haven't had time last couple studies to mention, but uh, just got this, actually. I've used Haley's Bible Handbook for years off and on. And uh, because of my vision problems I've been having, um, I've been, had, had trouble using it. It's, print was so small and everything. Well, I found this large print edition and it's also important that you make sure that it's with the King James Version and uh, I found it, uh, it retails $29.99 but I found it uh, I think $24.99 at KJV1611.org and uh, but I got my copy for less than 20 bucks at uh, Christian Book Distributors and I also had a code for free shipping so if you look around you, you get a good deal. Make sure you get the classic edition. It says right up the top there, classic edition. Because uh, after Haley died, they, you know, some of the publishers messed with it. Billy Graham put out a mass edition that was, was uh, different than the original. And, uh, and they change over to like the NIV and stuff like that. So be careful about that. But otherwise, you know, it's not an infallible book, but it's about an infallible book. And so if you compare this and uh, check it out. You always, Acts 17.11, you should always check it out. But the information I found very good. And uh, they give little uh, introductions to books and, and chapters or sections of the Bible. And it just gives you a little bit of knowledge of what you're reading about before you jump in there and read. Highly recommend that. All right. Um, where we left off in our last study was Lieutenant Colonel Abram of Ur had just led a battalion uh, raid on the Axis powers who had defeated the allies and taken Lot and his family. And so Abram uh, was able to recapture Lot and all those who had been taken and all the stuff taken at the Battle of Siddam, or what we called the uh, Slime Pit Massacre. And uh, these, this is part of a larger regional war that we could call the Salt Sea War or the Dead Sea Wars. And um, so Abram's taken them all back to Hebron. And verse 17 it says, and the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Kedor Laomer and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Shepha, which is the king's dale. And so um, this uh, massacre of the, uh, or slime pit massacre was followed up by this massacre or slaughter of Kedor Laomer, as the Bible says. And verse 18 says, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. Now you can't miss that. Um, that it's so clear that this is a very uh, important meeting taking place here with Abram who's on his way back to Hebron and here comes Melchizedek, king of Salem. Well you need to understand that Salem is Jerusalem. Jeru Salem. And uh, Melchizedek is a very important character and we'll, you'll read as you go through the Bible. You, his name will come up comes up in uh, Messianic Psalm uh, 110 where after uh, the Bible prophesies about Jesus saying this day have I begotten thee and um, John 3.16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and that at uh, his baptism God pronounces this uh, ministry of Jesus to, as Savior of the world and it says in verse 110 verse 4 the Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So you see what 
the Lord spoke over Jesus at the baptism, you go back and look it up in the Psalm, uh, Psalm 110 that prophesied that, and this is all part of that. God is declaring that Jesus is the high priest, and he's not of the order of Aaron, which was a human uh, priesthood that had to offer, a, a, the priest had to offer a sacrifice for his own sins, whereas Jesus didn't have to offer a sacrifice for any sin because he's sinless. And his blood was shed to pay for the sins of the world, not his own sins. If he had sin, then he could not pay for the sins of others. He would need a Savior himself. That's why any uh, teacher that says Jesus is not the eternal God, that teacher has destroyed the atonement. And there are people out there teaching that Jesus was a created being. Um, uh, we have a clip from uh, Victoria Osteen where she was saying that Jesus be was man until God touched him with his spirit. And that's a uh, adoptionism heresy. Jesus is eternally God. And he is a priesthood, priest, high priest, after the priesthood, not of Aaron, um, but after the order of Melchizedek. And in that verse, verse 4 of Psalm 110, we have to notice it's a forever priesthood. And secondly, that God swore this with an oath, his own oath. The Lord hath sworn. Now, neither of those are true about the Aaronic priesthood. There's no, no place where it's called an eternal uh, priesthood, and it, it wasn't established with God swearing an oath. And so uh, that there, there are differences you have to respect and understand between Aaron and Melchizedek and the priesthood named after them. It's called the Aaronic priesthood, A-A-R-O-N-I-C, after Aaron with an I-C on the end, or the Melchizedek. Um, or Melchizedekian priesthood, if you want to use the big $500 terminology. So, the book of Hebrews presents Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, as the high priest, and he is a priest after the order of Melchizedek, which puts huge importance on what we're reading here in Genesis 14. Again, in Hebrews 4, I want to turn there, Hebrews 4, and it's, I think, pretty much Hebrews chapter 4 verse uh, through Hebrews chapter 7 where you find um, this information about Jesus and Melchizedek. And in Hebrews chapter 4, we're going to look at verse 14. It says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, that's his ascension, when he, Acts chapter 1, um, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. And, um, of course, the well-known passage continues, and for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And that's why Jesus couldn't be uh, of the order of Aaron, because he, would, he didn't need a sacrifice for his own sins. He was of the order of Melchizedek. And uh, he, he's an He's our high priest. And that's why we don't need a priesthood like the Roman Catholic Church or, or the Mormon Church. They claim to have, I believe they even call theirs the Melchizedekian um, priesthood. It's just a blasphemous joke. Um, there is only one high priest of the Melchizedekian priesthood, and that's Jesus Christ. And there's no more a priesthood um, of pr particular individuals. We are all kings and priests in Christ Jesus. He's the high priest. He's the king of kings. You are a priest. You are a king. We will rule and reign with Jesus Christ in the millennium and throughout eternity. You see how all of this stuff works together? How important it is to understand it, get a grasp of it? So over in uh, the next chapter, uh, chapter 5, uh, verse uh, 5, I think, yeah, verse 5 says, uh, So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. And that happened at the baptism. Verse 6, As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And there's the reference right back to what we started with in Psalm 110, verse 4. So we're told clearly that Christ is a priest and the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And in verse, uh, verses 10 and 11, it continues, Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. 
and that's not only true about who uh, I believe Paul wrote Hebrews and these Hebrews that he's writing to, but it's, it's true pretty much of mankind. People say, oh, why didn't God tell us more? <laughs> People don't know what he has told us. Learn everything he's told us first and then talk about wanting to learn more. And the fascinating thing, amazing thing is God has given us more than we can handle already. I mean, he really has. Uh, you, you can talk to people um, who have read the Bible for their entire lives and lived into their 80s. And they read the Bible one to three to four times a year all those years. Do the math. <laughs> and, and then there's some who haven't read it more than once a year, but they've read it for anywhere from 20, 30, 40 years on up. And they all will tell you that they still continue to learn things. It's an amazing book. But don't let that discourage you because the journey, the trip is worth the time. I mean, it, it, and it's exciting because this year, this is 2015, I've learned so much. And I'm excited because I know in the coming year I'm going to learn more because I've been a Christian for 25 years and I've learned more every year, every year, every year. And then a lot of times, too, because we're human, we will see things and it'll be like, oh, yeah, I remember that. But it had kind of left our minds because our minds, our brains, our brains are fallen. Uh, I don't care how good you think your memory is, it's still a fallen uh, organ. <laughs> and, and so we need to put... Paul talks about putting the people in remembrance of these things makes you a good minister. To some of you, you've probably studied Genesis numerous times, and you're listening to me, and a lot of times you're saying, yeah, I remember that. Oh, yeah, I remember that. But it had kind of left your uh, thought processes, so it was good to be reminded. Amen? Amen. So, it, uh, we could, we, as he says in the close of verse 11, we, we could continue on and say many, many things. We could go on for weeks about this, folks. I'm not kidding you. But that gives you a little background. We'll come back to this in a minute. But it also says, uh, back in Genesis uh, 14, um, it said that, uh, let's see, let's read, um, what's it, where are we at? Uh, verse, where do I leave off? I think we just read verse 18. Yeah, verse 18. Yeah, exactly. It says that he brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And, uh, well, it, it says, and Melchizedek, king of Salem. Uh, Jerusalem. Salem is Jerusalem. And Salem is, uh, you know, you ought to get used to this. Uh, words have more than one pronunciation, especially when there's transliteration involved from Hebrew to English doesn't mean there's anything wrong calling Jesus, Jesus. doesn't mean you need to go back and try to, you know, call him Yesu because that was the Greek term, or call him Yeshua or Yehoshua or all this nonsense. It's God knows who you're talking about, and he has not uh, forbidden us from translating uh, even the name of Jesus Christ or Yeshua into Greek, Yesu, because he did it in the Greek Testament. Um, as you read the Greek New Testament, the apostles wrote in Koine Greek, and they wrote his name as Yesu. They didn't use the Jewish Hebrew form and just transliterate it. They actually translated it, Yesu, and then it comes over into English as Jesus. Well, Salem is Shalom. Shalom. It's peace. And uh, so Melchizedek means king of peace, king of Salem. And, uh, by the way, Jerusalem is also called Jebus a few times because of the Jebusites who controlled the area. And so keep that in mind as you're reading through. And it's how, I mean, how it stood out to me the first time I saw this. He brought forth bread and wine. Jesus is the priest, the high priest, after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek brought forth bread and wine. And what did Jesus do before he went to the cross but use bread and wine to establish the Lord's Supper? The parallels, the comparisons are amazing. And he's called um, the priest of the Most High. And it's just a footnote to say that um, the Jews um, taught that Melchizedek was Shem. And if you do the numbers and you figure it out, Shem would have still been alive during this time. And there are a lot of teachers who believe that this was Shem. Um, but there's also a, a group, and I have to be honest, I kind of lean the other way, 
that believes that um, the uh, this is a pre-incarnate visitation of Jesus Christ. We'll get into that a little bit in just a minute. The the city though uh, called Jerusalem. I want to mention the Yeru, and it, I got this note at the same time I found the Jewish reference to Melchizedek. And I don't have the. I'm not sure which one of my references I. Where I found this uh, information, but it was repeated a few times. So um, you'll find this in various places that the Jews taught that Melchizedek was Shem, and the city of Jerusalem, the Jeru in Hebrew was Yeru. So the Jeru means foundation stone or cornerstone. And of course, Jesus is the chief cornerstone, and he is the king of Jerusalem. And uh, the name Jerusalem then means the foundation stone of Shalim, Shalom. Peace, the foundation stone of peace, and uh, there's a lot of a lot a lot of inf interesting information about the actual name Jerusalem. But we continue in verse 19, and it says, "And he blessed him." This is Melchizedek blessing Abraham, and he blessed him and said, "Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth." Uh, this is not an ecumenical service. <laughs> Melchizedek is not a priesthood of a false religion. Um, he's not the high priest in a false religion. Abram is not compromising. These two worship the one true God. And um, it's important to get. Um, the, in, in the priesthood of Melchizedek, we're seeing this uh, basically like a prophetic observance of the Paschal, Passover observance that became the Lord's Supper. And this priesthood, we have to understand, is unique. It's original. And it's messianic. Um, it's different. And it's superior to the priesthood of Aaron, the Aaronic priesthood. And uh, the, the difference being that Melchizedek's priesthood is a forever priesthood. It's an eternal priesthood, whereas the the priesthood of Aaron was interrupted, it was corrupted, and it ended at the cross when the temple veil was torn. And um, in Hebrews 7, 3, interesting verse, it says that Melchizedek, like Jesus, was, quote, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but was made like unto the Son of God, and he abideth a priest continually. Now, that's an amazing statement. And that is what leads people to believe that this was a pre-incarnate visitation of Jesus. And um, it's called a theophany, Christophany. And um, that's the theological $50 word. So here Abram is not only, um, uh, wasn't the only man alive who worshipped the true God. And uh, I've kind of heard it painted that way, and I've kind of got my own uh, mistaken notion about this, uh, about Abram. Now, when it came to Noah, it came down to Noah and his family, and that was all there was. But by this time, you think, oh, is Abram the only one? I mean, it's the only one being talked about. You have to understand, God puts the spotlight on certain people, but that doesn't mean that there's no one else out there. And this is an example of that. You remember in Elijah, felt like he was the only one. He's feeling sorry for himself. And the Lord says, you know, no, there's uh, how many? I'm going to show you my lack of uh, uh, automatic recall. But he tells uh, Elijah that there are 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. And Elijah thought he was the only one. And so that's true about you today. As a matter of fact, a lot of you, you'll write me and, and, and I'll pray for you and you want to find a good church and there's none around. But you need to understand there's, it's very likely that there's people of like faith within your vicinity. And if you get out going door to door, you go out and um, uh, preach the gospel, you're busy in the ministry, the Lord may just see fit to unite the two of you or your two families or whatever the case may be. They may already be having meetings in their home and uh, you just aren't aware of it yet. Um, some of you know, and you watch our videos, you see Sister Martha. Well, that's how we met. Uh, just one day, my wife was door knocking and went up to her door and knocked on the door and met Martha. And um, she didn't have a good church, didn't know if there was any w that she could go to um, that was you know, feasible for her in where she lived and her situation. 
and she's been coming ever since. So that's just a word of encouragement to you. When you see this, you see these uh, references uh, in the Bible to the folks who thought they were all alone and they're not, just pray about it. Be faithful, pray about it, and if you get out there and you proclaim the truth of the gospel, it's amazing God brings people together. And, um, the, and also, just about the Bible itself, I want to mention, we aren't told everything. God has told us what we need to know. Uh, when we get to heaven, I am very hopeful and I, I really do believe we're going to learn a whole lot that we didn't get down here, not just because we have limited capabilities, but because we weren't told a whole lot. One of the most fascinating Bible verses is in John chapter 21 at the very end of God, John's Gospel. And he says in verse 24 and 25 in John chapter 21, This is the disciple which testifieth of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And this is what he says, verse 25. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. I don't think he's exaggerating, especially in his day. If you think of all the books that existed, uh, if you'd written down every wonderful thing Jesus did, all the miracles Jesus did, all the wonderful, gracious acts of Jesus, all the words that Jesus spoke, everything, and we're only given, you know, mainly, other than a his birth and his age 12 uh, visit in the temple were given the last three years of his life. If we were to be given other things that happened before the uh, wedding of Cana, you just imagine what we don't know just about Jesus in his 33 and a half years on this earth. And then you look at the Bible itself, and it's just so much we're not told. But don't complain about the fact that God didn't give you more unless you've learned everything he's got for you already. Now, verse 20 is a verse that comes up a lot in the controversy with the tithing thing. And uh, so I have to say this. I'm, going to just, I'm not going to get in deep, but I just want you to know. I believe that a Christian should give at least 10% of his income back to the Lord. That doesn't necessarily mean the local church because there's no such thing as a storehouse in the New Testament. Storehouse tithing um, is a Old Testament concept because the the temple was the storehouse. The local church isn't the temple. And um, so that application and the Southern Baptists and a lot, a lot of independent Baptists are big on that and it's wrong. It's, it's an unsound use of scripture. It's not rightly dividing. But giving at least 10% of what gave you and giving it back to the Lord. It can be you're giving to the local church, you're giving to missions, to the soup kitchen downtown that preaches the gospel. You can just buy things that you see people need. You can buy books, buy tracts and things and give them away, whatever. But if you can't give 10% of what God gives you, and everybody like say, oh, it wasn't on income. It, it, it was and it wasn't. They didn't have the same setup we have today, but it, they gave 10% of everything God gave them. So that would include their income. And um, But is it a law? I don't know if, now, and I've made some of you mad because I believe that 10% is a good standard. This is before the Mosaic Law, and it's the standard that seems to be understood by everybody. But fast forward and, and the, to the New Testament, and uh, it's not taught as a law. And I don't get up and say, you should be ashamed of yourself if you're not given 10%. You're sinning. I'm not saying that at all. What I teach is that uh, how, how do I decide what to give? Well, the Lord has prospered me. Uh, to a certain extent, and whatever he has prospered me in, I try to give 10% of that back to him as a minimum. I'm not going to go into detail, but I'm telling you, uh, my wife and I, can, uh, you know, as we stand before the Lord, can tell you that that's our minimum. And we try to give way over and above that. And uh, that's all I'm going to say about that. But uh, the, the purpose of this text isn't to debate the tithing issue. The purpose is to show you something. And in verse um, uh, 20, it says, And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. So that's the blessing. And then it says, And he gave him tithes of all. So Abram is giving tithes to Melchizedek. And then we fast forward to Hebrews chapter 7. 
and from verses 4 to 10, we're, giving, we're given the information we need to understand this. And it's not about New Testament tithing and, and, and storehouse tithing and all that. In Hebrews 7, it says in verse 4, Now consider how great this man was. See, that's the point. Unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. You see that? And by the way, a couple of you have written me and said that you, th you think it's terrible that I slip up every once in a while and I call him Abraham because right now he's Abram. The Holy Spirit does that. So I don't make, you know, if, if it was that big of a deal, I would try to, you know, m note to self and make a big deal about it. But here, at this point where God is still calling him Abram, in the New Testament, in Hebrews, it says the patriarch Abraham uh, gave the tenth of the spoils. So I do think the name difference is important, and we'll talk about that when that name change takes place from God. But to use it interchangeably, it's like calling Paul and Saul. It's, it's not a big deal. Um, it's not some kind of sin. So it continues, verse 5, And verily they that are of the sons of Levi, who received the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they came out of the loins of Abraham. Now verse 6, But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. Melchizedek didn't come from Abraham and he's not one of the you know children of Israel. And he received tithes from Abraham. Now listen to the point. Verse 7, And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. And here, verse 8, And here men that die receive tithes but there he receiveth them, of whom it is witness that he liveth. Verse 9, And as I may say so, or I'm sorry, And as I may so say, Levi also who receiveth tithes, from sinners like himself, paid tithes in Abraham. Verse 10, For he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. So the Aaronic priesthood is a lesser priesthood, obviously, because in Abraham they tithed to Melchizedek, and the lesser blesses the greater. The lesser gives tithes to the greater. So there's a very strong hint of the reality of the priesthood of uh, Melchizedek and, and that Jesus being of the priesthood of Melchizedek is a superior priesthood. Verse 21, And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. Verse 22, And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lift up mine hand unto the Lord, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth, verse 23, that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abram rich. See, Abram wanted to, uh, all of his prosperity and all of his glory to be something God gave him so that he could testify of God's goodness. And he wasn't just wanting to be rich for the sake of being rich. And so verse 24 closes. He's continuing. He says, Save only that which the young men have eaten and the portion of the men which went with me, Aner, Eshkol, and Memory. Let them take their portion. And that's how the chapter closes with Abram giving God all the glory and not taking the spoils from this because he says, If I'm going to be rich, it's going to be God's doing. Abram wanted God's will, and that's what he lived for. And that's our example also in this text. For solid King James Bible preaching and teaching, along with the encouragement of the psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, tune in to our internet radio station available every day, 24 hours a day, at bbfohioradio.com. Join listeners from over 150 nations, all 50 U.S. states, and other U.S. territories who are tuning in and receiving free Bible teaching at bbfohioradio.com.